I'd like to talk for a minute or two about one very important issue this afternoon. It's a fact that probably when the population of the world was only a million or a couple of million people, the use of land and the amount of land used by various individuals wasn't an issue. Today it is becoming progressively more of an issue. We're going beyond six billion people in the world itself and it's important to realize that we're reaching a stage where the amount of cultivable land per person is being reached to the point where we simply don't have enough of it if we carry on doing what we're doing. The amount of land per person, let me just show you two simple little bits of card. Think of that as the size of a football field. And for the average person in the average system around the world, you have got two of those, i.e. the equivalent of two football fields per person so that we can live the way that we are eating at the moment. It's important to realize that we have reached a point at we, that we are beyond that now and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second or two. But bear in mind that each of those is approximately an acre, slightly more, Put the two together and you've got approximately one hectare of land, which is just over two acres. And that's per person throughout the world in general. So bear those points in mind when I show you the amount that a lot of different people in different parts of the world are actually using now. So what we're going to look at now is what different types of diet different types of nutrition, the actual food that you eat, the effect that it has on the amount of land that you need to support you. And let's start for a second or two with a vegan, that is someone who consumes no animal products whatsoever. That person can live perfectly happily, in fact considerably easy, more easily than normal on that amount of land, which is the amount of land which I just introduced you to as being the maximum that we've got. I have now here a number of other cards and I'll try and indicate to you the amount of land necessary in relation to what you eat. If you have a very small amount of milk in your diet, you add it to this, you can add one more of those. If you have a few eggs in your diet, perhaps three a week, something like that, you can add that much again to the amount of land that you're using. As soon as you start to eat any meat, add certainly some poultry, which is the usual thing, you're using that much land again. And this is only if you have a moderate, a very moderate amount of these things. If you have a fair amount of eggs in your diet or occasional chicken, now we're talking about that area of land. Let's look at the, what happens when you increase to what would be called a standard American diet. I'm not sure I've got enough pieces of paper here, but look at the difference we're talking about. If you start eating the standard American diet, this is the amount of land that you'll be consuming. I haven't, as you can see, got any space for all of it. Now the standard American diet consumed by most Europeans, most Australians, New Zealanders, which has a relatively high amount of meat in it, as you can see, we are off the chart. 
We're so much off the chart that the average American diet uses three and a half times as much land as we have available per person in the world. Now if they choose to send things out to Mars to see if they can go over there, that would probably be the best plan because there simply isn't enough land to support this amount of people eating this amount of meat. So the important thing to bear in mind in relation to land use as a whole is that the more land you're consuming, the more meat you're eating, the more dairy products you have, the more you eat chicken. Obviously fish is a different issue, uh, because most of the oceans in the world are overfished now so whilst that contributes to the overall amount of protein it is not a long-term answer. The long-term answer is to change people's diets and it, ne it needs to be done in a way which is as friendly as possible. There are now dozens of wonderful products which are vegan or ultra low in animal products which will help and enable people to quite easily change from one type of diet to another. It needs to be done gradually. You've got to support the farmers up to a point, uh, otherwise they won't make the changes. But the nitty gritty about all these sorts of issues is that if we don't do it, there will be no wildlife left. That's right, that's what I said, no wildlife left. And of course we cannot survive without wildlife because wildlife not only is it good for you mentally but even more important perhaps is that we need bugs, we need worms, we need soil bacteria, we need all those little bits and pieces, all the various things that we take for granted. We need bumblebees, we need ordinary bees for fertilization of the fruit and vegetables and so on. So all of what we call wildlife is an essential part of us being able to stay on this planet. If we get rid of that wildlife, we will be the losers because we will not survive as a result. There would be no apples without bees to fertilize the apple trees. Can you imagine if you wanted to fertilize an apple tree, you would have to go around with a little tiny brush, touch on one flower and go to the next flower and go to the next flower. At the moment, the bees and bugs and flies and all sorts of small creatures, insects mostly, do that job for nothing, free. They do that fantastic job, which if we tried to do it, would take us a week just to fertilize two or three trees with a little tiny brush. So wildlife do a wonderful job for us. And without them, we will not survive as a people. Maybe that's a good thing, who knows? If the world got rid of us, then obviously it would change to something different. But why? Hopefully, I want people to be healthy and I want our race, our species to be able to carry on for many, many millennia yet. Of course, we might be hit by an asteroid tomorrow morning, who knows? Although we'll probably get a, a week or two's warning with all the technology that there is around today, but we're not going to be able to stop that asteroid. The type of thing which wiped out most of the dinosaur, uh, dinosaurs 65 million years ago could happen tomorrow morning. But I think it's important for us to realize that if we carry on the way we're going with the amount of meat in particular that we're eating, to produce a kilo of beef takes 20 times as much land as to produce a kilo of vegetable-based protein. Yes, I said that, 20 times the area. You put in X amount of protein into any type of animal, it has to stay alive. So it is using a huge amount of energy, proteins, carbohydrates, just to stay alive. If we don't change with the wind, bend with the wind as a willow tree does, 
in relation to an issue as important as this, then we will wipe ourselves out. It would be much simpler and quicker, quicker, obviously, to have a nuclear war. But issues like this will result in tensions between nations if we don't get it right. Because population increases, now six and a half billion, something like that, scheduled to be somewhere up eight or nine billion by the middle of this coming century. At the moment, because there are about a billion and a half people who are eating far too much animal-produced foods, there are about a billion and a half people who are grossly undernourished. And those people who are undernourished simply die off. And it's something which is heartbreaking for us to see it, but we are the cause of that happening because we eat far too much of the proteins and carbohydrates which they should be consuming. Changing the diet means changing that whole ethic, changing the whole way in which we can live happily on this world with everybody else. It means saving lives on a dramatic way. We need to watch what the science is saying, and the science is completely and utterly clear on these types of issues.